Hi, I'm Bart Ziegler, and uh, I'm the president of the Sam Lawrence Foundation. And good, each of you made time in your day to attend this especially remarkable webinar. We're honored to have with us uh, Stanford University Professor of Civil, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Mark Z. Jacobson, uh, to discuss his recently published book. And we are very fortunate to have Ken Cook, president and co-founder of the Environmental Working Group, who's an advocate for public health and environmental protection. Let me just make a quick shout out to the partners, which include Beyond Nuclear, NEIS, NIRS, California Climate Voters, Mothers for Peace, Nuclear Consulting Group, Environmental Working Group, Sierra Club of California, without collaboration and partnership will not do justice to the planet. I'll hand it over to you, Ken Cook. Thank you very much. Bart, thank you very much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. My job here is to introduce Mark a little bit in his book, which I have uh, enormously recommend to all of you, and, uh, and then to moderate the chat. So here's the, the rules of the road are, if you have a, a question, please put, type it into the chat. Um, I'll field them as best I can. When we get to that point, Mark is going to speak for about 30, maybe 35 minutes, and he does have uh, uh, does have a deck of slides to uh, to accompany um, his remarks. Uh, we we won't be able to go live and bring people onto the screen. Uh, don't we don't want to have that don't have that capability and feel like it would go better if we just have the questions in the chat. We're here um, uh, out of commitment, um, and Mark's commitment goes goes very deep. Uh, we're here to uh, help you uh, get some tools to make a difference, and I think this book is right up at the top of the tools now that I've now that I've read it. So I just want to say a couple of things about the uses of this book. And the book is called No Miracles Needed. Um, and uh, the subtitle is How Today's Technology Can Save Our Climate and Our Clean Air. Today's technology, super, super important. So uses of the book. First of all, I think it's the best sort of narrative arc for exploring most of the key climate and energy issues of our day. And it, it is told in a dispassionate way, grounded in facts and analysis. Uh, it's not a heavy ideological push that is looking for facts to bolster it. It's quite the opposite. He's approached it like an engineer, solving a big problem. And this problems don't get much bigger than this. And the book follows uh, point A to point B. When you get to point B, and you've heard the whole story, if you read it sequentially, uh, you, you may or may not agree with where Mark comes out. I personally, I do, but you will have seen the argument laid out in you know, straightforward detail uh, for any uh, level of interest or understanding that you might bring to the book in terms of energy policy. So it's just, it's just the, the book you wanna have for that purpose if you wanna read front to back and understand our current energy major questions and solutions. But the second use of it, and I've already made use of it in this way, which is really as a reference book, because as you, as you get a chance to look at it and open the table of contents, you can also at any given time dip into one of the chapters or one of the sections and get answers to all kinds of, or discussion at least. You may not want to accept it as an answer right away. I, I find it very compelling in that fact, in that in that use, but, but you'll be able to use this book in a way that will help you navigate questions that come up. I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, what, what's the role of rooftop solar? What are the pros and cons? Uh, what, you know, what's, what's with nuclear power? How does it fit in or not fit into our climate solution set? Uh, wind turbines and birds, on and on. It doesn't really matter what particular key hot topic you might pick. Mark has covered it in this book, and you can pull that out just, just like you don't have to watch Game of Thrones beginning to end. You can, you can watch individual segments, and it's very gratifying. This is Game of Thrones does energy. Uh, that doesn't really work. But anyway, you get the idea. It's a fantastic book. I, I can't uh, thank you enough for writing it, Mark. Uh, he is, I'll just say one, one more time, Stanford professor, Stanford University professor of civil and environmental engineering. He's the director of the Atmos Energy Program at Stanford University, co-founder of the Solutions Project with my buddy and your buddy, Mark Ruffalo, um, and, uh, and of the 100% movement. 
Um, and he is the author of the book we're talking about today, No Miracles Needed. There may be, a, there may be one or two miracles needed, but we'll get to those at the end. <laughs> Mark, it's, it's all yours. Thanks so much for writing this book and thanks for joining us today. Wow, thank you so much, Ken. That was such a nice introduction, very generous. And Bart too, thank you so much for uh, having me on here. I'm going to um, share my screen. I'll start this um, start, start this uh, talk. Uh, one sec. So I'm going to first um, motivate. Let's motivate why uh, I became interested in this. Well, I'm really interested in trying to address three problems simultaneously. There's air pollution, global warming, and energy insecurity. Um, air pollution has been around for hundreds uh, to thousands of years now, actually, since uh, really the dawn of civilization. Uh, but today, it kills 7 million people each year, and hundreds of millions more are injured. And based on statistical cost of life, it's on the order of $30 trillion per year. Global warming is estimated to cost $30 trillion per year by 2050. Uh, and today, you can already see damage that's accruing on a daily basis, uh, wild, enhanced wildfires, enhanced air pollution due to higher temperatures, more droughts, more floods, more severe storms, more shifts in agriculture and losses in agriculture, higher sea levels, melting of ice, coral reef loss, and it goes on and on. Um, the third problem is energy insecurity, and there are many types of energy insecurity, and I'll just touch upon them. You know, one is just the, on the large scale, well, the facts that fossil fuels and uranium are limited resources, they will run out at some point, and that will result in economic, social, and political instability unless we have an alternative in place. Uh, in addition, many countries have uh, supply fossil fuels and control those fossil fuels to other countries, and so in times of conflict, like as you see now, uh, then some countries can hold energy hostage to other countries. Similarly, just transporting fossil fuels long distance, like over the water to island countries, results in extremely high electricity prices up to 50 to 70 cents per kilowatt hour. And those island countries can be self-sufficient with just renewable energy. Anyway, there are other types of energy insecurity as well, but these are all three problems that we're trying to solve simultaneously. So the thing is, I'm not going to just look at solutions that solve climate, for example, they have to address climate and air pollution and energy insecurity simultaneously. And this is why some of the solutions that are discussed in the book are, and the, some of the solutions we do not include, which I'll discuss as well here, um, they're, they're not included because they do not address all three problems. Well, first of all, let's talk about what is the solution that we've been proposing for the last, well, since 2009, uh, it's to transition or electrify everything, to electrify transportation, buildings, industry, and then provide the electricity with just clean renewable energy, namely wind, water, and solar. And we define wind, water, and solar as onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal electricity, and also some geothermal heat, uh, hydroelectricity, tidal and wave power, even though those two aren't growing very fast. And, but there are other smaller ones that are, if they emerge, especially fine, but we are, we're not going to use any combustion uh, for electricity or, or anything else. Uh, for transportation, we'd go almost entirely to battery electric with some hydrogen fuel cell for long distance transport, like long distance aircraft and ships, and maybe some long distance heavy military vehicles. And all the electricity for both the hydrogen would be green hydrogen. I'll discuss that in a sec, but where the uh, hydrogen is produced from wind, water, solar, electricity. And the electricity for the batteries would also come from wind, water, solar. For buildings, we use, we electrify those, no gas in buildings at all. Uh, electric heat pumps for air and water heating and air conditioning, uh, and also heat pumps for uh, clothes dryers, uh, electric induction cooktops for stoves, and I'll talk about buildings uh, further. Some buildings will be on district heating systems like they are now, uh, where you can not only use heat pumps to raise the temperature or lower the temperature for the boilers or chillers, but you can also use uh, geothermal heat for the district heating or large scale solar heating for that as well. Uh, for industry, we'd electrify that with electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters, for steel production, for example, we would go to the hydrogen uh, reduction process. So hydrogen would replace coal for converting iron oxide to pure iron. Anyway, there's already a, a steel 
mill in Sweden now that uses hydrogen and the hydrogen is green hydrogen and everything else has been converted. So even the arc, they use an electric arc furnace as well, and that's provided with green electricity. And so there's 98% reduction of fossil fuels from that process, 98% uh, reduction of carbon emissions from that process. Anyway, there are solutions for cement, like using geopolymer cement and ferroc instead of uh, Portland cement, uh, recycling cement. Uh, there are existing technologies. We have 95% of the technologies we need right now to affect a transition. The ones we don't have are the long distance aircraft and ships, primarily in some industrial processes. But we know for the most part how to do that. And we expect that those technologies to be in place within the next five to 10 years. For storage, of course, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. Uh, there's electricity storage, heat storage, cold storage, and hydrogen storage that's needed. The electricity storage options, concentrated solar power uh, with storage, pumped hydro storage, existing hydroelectric dams or big batteries, basically, batteries themselves, flywheels, compressed air storage, gravitational storage with solid masses. These are all existing technologies and you know batteries are of course the most convenient and if their cost their cost is now like 100 to 200 dollars per kilowatt hour if it gets down to like 60 dollars per kilowatt hour uh, then that really changes makes it really easy to transition on a large scale economically and even there are some batteries iron air for example it's been proposed that it's going to be five to ten dollars per kilowatt hour um, if that actually wor works at that cost, that's even ama more amazing and we'll have an easy ship. Uh, heating and cooling, well, for uh, hot water and cold water, we'd have water tank storage, which is already existing in large scale, uh, ice storage for cooling, and then underground storage for bowl in bowl boreholes, water pits, and aquifers for mostly heat storage, but also cold storage and aquifers in some cases. Uh, and then building materials is a method of storing heat. And then of course hydrogen and, and with respect to hydrogen okay so they're good and bad sources of hydrogen and uses so i try to summarize what i think are good and bad so the only good hydrogen i think is green hydrogen which you produce from an electrolyzer running on wind water solar electricity uh, bad is gray and blue which comes from natural gas without and with carbon capture respectively uh, black and brown hydrogen from anthracite and lignite coal pink hydrogen from nuclear electricity and turquoise hydrogen from methane pyrolysis. Those we do not recommend, but we have green hydrogen today, although 96% of all hydrogen produced today is gray hydrogen from natural gas. So we have to, now that green hydrogen is becoming less expensive, we need to shift away from uh, that gray hydrogen. Well, what about uses? Well, first I'll talk about what we don't want to use it for. Uh, we do not, want to use, it's not, it's not efficient to use hydrogen for passenger vehicles. Uh, it's clean if it's green hydrogen, but it's you take need two and a half to three times the number of wind turbines to run a passenger vehicle on green hydrogen uh, versus a battery electric vehicle. So why waste so much uh, opportunity with that? Uh, heating buildings is not a good use of, uh, of hydrogen. You know, like for example, utilities are proposing to put mixed hydrogen with natural gas instead of the buildings. Well, that just allows combustion and pollution to continue and natural gas to continue, in fact, whereas heat pumps use one fourth the energy uh, as burning things. So those are the best. Uh, and we wanna go pretty much entirely to heat pumps for heating and cooling of buildings. We do not wanna burn hydrogen to the extent we can, uh, just use them in fuel cells. And in most cases, we don't wanna use it for grid electricity. Um, and I'll, although some cases it is advantageous, batteries, are a lot more efficient. The round trip efficiency of a battery is uh, much better than going from an electrolyzer to compressor to storage to fuel cell for grid electricity for hydrogen. Uh, the, there is some advantage in hydrogen in the storage cost is lower. However, you need batteries for two purposes. One is for storage and uh, storage capacity and the other is for peak discharge. And to get the same peak discharge uh, as a battery, you need a lot of fuel cells and fuel cells are more expensive than is batteries for peak discharging. And when you actually look at it all, it's actually better pretty much everywhere to use batteries. Although there's some situations where if you combine batteries with some fuel cells at 100%, near 100% renewables on the grid, then it's a little bit cheaper when you combine the two. But in most places in the world, it's just using batteries alone is the best. So the good applications of hydrogen are long distance aircraft 
ships, trains, trucks, and military vehicles, and that's really long distance. And so like for aircraft, it's greater than 1500 kilometers. Uh, you know, about 84% of all flights by number are less than 1500 kilometers. So those would be electric. Uh, so it's 16% of the flights by number or about 46% of flights by distance uh, would be hydrogen fuel cell. And also for ammonia production and steel manufacturing, we need hydrogen and uh, electricity and heat for remote microgrids, you know, combining again, batteries with hydrogen fuel cells can actually help um, help the remote communities up in Northern Alaska, for example, uh, provide electricity year round. Uh, and as I mentioned, some cases of grid electricity, but not most cases. Now, okay, so why? Well, we do not include carbon capture, direct air capture, small modular nuclear, bioenergy, and non-hydrogen uh, e-fuels or geoengineering as part of our solutions. Uh, first, I, I'm gonna show you this photograph. I actually took the photograph on the bottom right uh, about a week and a half ago in Los Angeles. And you can see how bad the pollution is. That's still, I mean, Los Angeles, you know, millions of people live there. And in California is the most polluted state in the US still. About over 13,000 people die of air pollution in California each year and about 80,000 in the US. And on the top left is a photo of Los Angeles from 1958. We have not come a long way. I mean, we have come a long way and the peaks of air pollution are much lower. I mean, it used to be the peak air pollution, the record in Los Angeles. I don't know if, it's, if anybody's measured any higher ozone in the world anywhere than in Los Angeles. It was like 980 parts, 980 parts per billion. Uh, the federal standard for ozone, eight hour standard is 70 parts per billion. So in the, in the 1950s, there's a measure of 980. We don't get anything close to those peaks. There are more, uh, most you get is like 150, but it's spread out over a larger area. But you still have this pollution. We should not, this is all from energy almost. I mean, about 90% of all air pollution is from energy and about 75 to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions are from energy. And this is just un, unacceptable. I mean, we do, we need to stop combustion, stop burning things. It's from both <clears throat> burning of fossil fuels and biofuels, transportation, buildings, industry, and electricity. And carbon capture, direct air capture, bioenergy, uh, geoengineering, and blue hydrogen, for example, they all increase air pollution. They all increase. So why would we have something that increases air pollution? You might ask why. Well, carbon capture, for example, 30%, you need, if you're putting carbon capture on a coal plant, 30% of the electricity from the coal plant needs to be used to run the carbon capture equipment. Or alternatively, you need to mine 30% more coal to run that carbon capture equipment. And that means, and a carbon capture does not eliminate any air pollutant. It takes out carbon dioxide, which is not a standard air pollutant. I mean, it does affect air pollution indirectly through higher temperatures and water vapor. But it's not it's not reducing any air pollutants. It's actually increasing air pollution 30%. And then 75% of carbon dioxide that's captured gets shipped today worldwide to for enhanced oil recovery through pipes. And that results in 40% 40, 40 of that carbon that is captured goes right back to the air during that process. And it also results in more oil being burned and, and used. And the efficiency of carbon capture equipment is not 90%, it's between 20 and 70% in the annual average based on actual data. And because you're not actually stopping any CO2 with the, uh, from the mining and you need extra energy to run it, you're actually emitting more CO2 that has to be captured. So when you actually count for everything, you're only capturing about 11 to 20% of the CO2 when, CO2 when a capture equipment is added to a coal or gas plant. And that's before you even account for the enhanced oil recovery and you lose 40% there. So you're really talking about a seven to 12% capture rate, which is useless. And you're increasing air pollution, you're increasing mining of fuels, you're increasing fossil fuel infrastructure. Same thing with direct air captures. It, it takes energy and it requires equipment. It only reduces CO2. So because you have all that extra energy you're using, you're either running fo more fossil fuel to produce electricity to run the direct air capture, creating more air pollution, or you're using wind and solar, preventing that wind and solar from replacing a coal or gas plant, which would eliminate the air pollution from that coal or gas plant. Now you can't eliminate that pollution. So you're effectively increasing pollution too. Same thing with blue hydrogen, which is natural gas producing hydrogen with carbon capture. You're adding, you need more energy, you need more natural gas to run that equipment that results in more air pollution. So 
just to summarize, carbon capture, direct air capture, bioenergy too, because you're just burning a different fuel instead of oil or gas uh, to produce it, or to, to pr produce electricity or uh, to run a car. Uh, those all create air pollution. Carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, bioenergy, also non-hydrogen electrofuels. So some people propose taking, for example, carbon dioxide and creating a fuel to replace gasoline. That's a note, you know, this is another harebrained scheme because you're still burning fuels to create air pollution. You need a lot of chemicals to create the fuel. You need a lot of energy and you got to capture that carbon, which we just talked about was completely inefficient. And so anyway, there's no basis for that. And geoengineering is the most commonly talked about type of geoengineering is dumping particles into the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. Of course, that's also not helpful at all because it just <clears throat> allows emissions to continue, air pollution to continue, uh, makes people complacent and costs money. And so it's an opportunity cost that doesn't solve any problem. It just masks a problem and there's just all sorts of side effects that I can't even get into. All right, so let's, um, I'm gonna sh shift quickly to talk about, well, what can you do in an individual home? And I'm gonna talk about my own home um, just because I have some data from that. And I, in 2017, I built a new home from scratch, uh, no gas, all electric, has uh, solar on the roof, batteries in the garage, heat pumps. So it's 13.6 kilowatts of solar. Uh, there's four uh, first generation Tesla wall mount batteries, 3.3 kilowatt discharge each. So uh, 12, 13, uh, so it's 13.2 kilowatts total discharge and there's about two hours of storage. So uh, 26.4 kilowatt hours about of storage. And for heating, use what's called a ductless mini split electric heat pump for air heating and air conditioning. So there's, there are no ducts, but you have inside units like on the left in each room, and then you have two of these outside units. And so there are about five or six inside units connected to each outside unit and they just exchange fluid. Uh, through a, a thin pipe uh, and the heat pumps do not create heat or destroy it they just move it around so they take it from the outside and move it in or take um, heat from the inside and move it outside so they don't because they're not creating heat they are much more efficient than gas or even electric resistance heaters using one fourth the energy so it uses hardly any energy um, same with the water heater this is a heat pump water heater it's just plugged into the wall, has some pipes for the water, but there's no natural gas pipes. And in fact, I saved a lot of money by not putting natural gas in the home. I saved a $6,000 hookup fee. I saved about $10,000 in pipes. And, and, but it's really simple. This, so this heat pump water heater uses one fourth the energy as a natural gas heater. And it works really well, it has not had a single problem uh, in, since in the last six years. Uh, for cooking an induction cooktop, uh, which boils water in half the time as natural gas. And it doesn't, even when you're boiling water and you touch the stove, it doesn't hurt because you're not actually heating the stove. Uh, you're, it's just due to the electrical resistance in the pot. It has to be an iron or stainless steel pot, something that is resistive. And the electric currents in the induction cooktop will induce currents in the pot and due to the resistance, those currents in the pot dissipate to heat. So the pot heats up, but the stove does not. And it cooks really evenly. I show this one on the left because that you can buy one of these for like 30 to 80 or $90. And I mentioned 7 million people dying from air pollution. Well, about 2.4 million people each year die from indoor air pollution, from indoor burning of biomass and coal for home heating and cooking, and mostly in developing countries. And just by replacing you know, burning a wood burning stove or dung burning stove uh, with an electric resistance, you can eliminate most of the air pollution in a home or a lot of it. And, but you, of course you need electricity source. And so we, we do need to transition. There are a lot of um, places that do not even have electricity. So, you know, having microgrids that run on solar batteries and electrical appliances and through a community, this is an important part of the transition. It's transitioning everywhere, not just um, not just here. So it's a worldwide transition, which I'll get to in a second. Well, after five, the first five years, I generated 120% of all my home and vehicle uh, electricity needs. I have electric vehicles too. No electric bill, no natural gas bill or gasoline bill, and received an average of $860 a year from Silicon Valley Clean Energy, which is the community choice aggregation utility that I've signed up with. They take the extra electricity. 
Um, so this should, the numbers below that show kind of typical values for a, for a home um, that you would save. So I, like I avoided six thousand dollars in gas hookup fee. The range is three to eight thousand. Gas pipes two to fifteen thousand is the range. Electric bills, natural gas bills, vehicle fuel bills. So on average, it's a total of five to twenty three thousand dollars up front, plus three to ten thousand per year in savings. And in my case, I have a five year had a five year payback time, so I've already paid back the whole solar and battery system. And that, but that's with subsidies offered by California and the U.S. Without subsidies, it would be about ten years, but the solar is warranted for twenty five years. Uh, one more point about this: so this is some data from the hottest day of the year in twenty twenty, September six. So the green is my solar production. Uh, the blue is the uh, consumption during the day, mostly for the heat pumps for air conditioning. So it was 106 degrees outside and inside it maintained the temperature at 77 degrees. And during the day, it's directly from the solar. After the sun goes down, it comes from the battery. And then the red is grid electricity. But on that day, as you can see on the top right, I actually uh, produced 14 more kilowatt hours than I consumed over the whole day and sent the extra back to the grid. And this was a day where people are prone, we're prone to blackouts in California. So if everybody did this, we would have no blackouts on the grid, or if all buildings were um, had solar and batteries, there would be no blackouts because we'd be using a lot less energy. Heat pumps are so efficient, they hardly use any energy for keeping a building cool. And even in California, we have a lot of solar in California, but we also have potential for a lot of offshore wind. And even when the sun goes down, a lot of times blackouts occur right after sunset. Uh, you know, we can fill in that gap after sunset with offshore wind um, if we actually can grow that offshore wind. Now, a stumbling block to that growing is, well, there's one big transmission line to the coast uh, in California, and that's the one that goes to Diablo Canyon. And so by keeping Diablo Canyon open, that's actually slowing down the growth of offshore wind right there uh, because it's very difficult for a company to build an offshore wind farm when there's no transmission to the shore. And so it would, it'll take a while to get more transmission. So this is a problem with that, keeping that Diablo Canyon open. Um, next question is, can the world transition to 100% renewables for all purposes? So we developed roadmaps for 145 countries and also separately did all 50 US states. And just to summarize on these roadmaps, uh, if we look at some all, well, these countries represent 99.7% of all world emissions for the 145 countries. So in 2018, the end use demand for these countries was 13.1 trillion watts or terawatts. That's expected to go up to 20.4 terawatts. And this is for all energy purposes. But if we electrify all energy and provide the electricity with wind, water, solar, we go down to 8.9 terawatts or 56.4%. And that's for five reasons here. Uh, one is the efficiency of battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles over internal combustion engine vehicles. That accounts for 20.5% of the reduction. Uh, electrifying industry is 4.3%. The efficiency of heat pumps is 13.6%. Eliminating fuel mining. I mean, 11.3% of all energy worldwide is used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. We would not need that energy if we don't use those fuels. And then 6.6% is due to end use energy efficiency improvements and reducing energy use beyond what's expected in a business as usual case. So that adds up to 56.4%. So this kind of shows the same thing, but it's a timeline going from 2020 to 2050. If we don't do anything, we go along the top line. But if we electrify and provide the electricity with wind, water, solar, our energy consumption or requirements go down significantly by those five shades of colors down to the 100% WWS line and for the five reasons I mentioned. And so then we're left with 8.9 terawatts that we provide with just wind, water, and solar. And this transition, well, this graph shows an 80% transition by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And we would need that transition if we want CO2 in the atmosphere to go down to 100, sorry, 350 parts per million by 2100. But, you know, if we can transition 80% by 2030, we should be able to transition the rest um, soon after. So this shows a transition timeline <coughs> with the same endpoint in 2050, <coughs> excuse me, um, but it's 100% transition by 2035. So this is 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2035. and this is what I think we really need and we can accomplish if we actually put our mind to it. Um, but of course, 
social and political barriers may slow that down. Okay, so in this, we develop individual plans for the 145 countries, and this shows the average of uh, the wind, water, solar distribution over those 145 countries under the world column. So 32% onshore wind, 13% offshore wind, 16% roof PV, 30% utility PV, 3% CSP, less than 1% geothermal electricity, 5% hydroelectricity, tiny amounts of tidal and wave, and some geothermal and solar heat. Of course, there are many options. I mean, this is not the only uh, possibility. I mean, there could be more rooftop solar, less utility solar, more offshore wind, less onshore wind. Plus, a lot depends on how the prices work out. And in the US, I just showed distribution uh, there too, um, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, later. But in terms of land use, this is for new land. We don't need any new land for offshore wind or tidal or wave power. And we're not adding any new hydro in any of these plans. Uh, rooftop PV does not take up any new land. There's very little geothermal. So the new land is mostly utility PV plus CSP and onshore wind. In the case of the PV plus CSP, that's actually what we call footprint on the ground, um, although it doesn't have to be. I mean, some of the, we can actually put offshore you, you know, PV now or, or on reservoirs, or we can elevate it above the ground over agricultural fields. So it doesn't have to be footprint on the ground, but let's just call it that for here. And then onshore wind, which is really spacing between wind turbines that can be used for agriculture, open space, farmland, rangeland. Uh, so they, for the world, the total footprint area is about 0.17% and the spacing area is 0.36%. So that's 0.53%. It's like half a percent of world land. In the U.S., it's 0.84 percent. For comparison, in the U.S., the fossil fuel industry occupies 1.3 percent of all U.S. land area. If you count for the 1.3 million active oil and gas wells, the 3.2 million abandoned wells, the millions of miles of pipelines, the hundreds of thousands of gas stations, the storage facilities, the refineries, the coal mines, etc. So we think we would reduce land requirements. And plus, with fossil fuels, there are 50,000 new oil and gas wells drilled every year uh, in North America alone. And once you have a wind, water, solar infrastructure, the increases each year are relatively minor because we're not continuously mining for fuels. We, the, you know, the wind comes right to the turbine, the solar comes right to the panel. Okay, can we keep the grid stable? We did grid stability studies in all um, in 24 world regions, encompassing all 145 countries, and found that we can keep the grid stable. Uh, with at, at a 30 second resolution. So we had wind and solar data for every 30 seconds throughout the world and combined that with uh, energy demand data and with storage assumptions about storage and demand response. And we found that we could keep the grid stable every 30 seconds everywhere in the world. And what's and this shows that this was uh, for the US um, the, for two years, every 30 seconds, uh, but this shows an hourly resolution of the graph. And then on the bottom graph, that's for a 100-day period, just showing the matching of supply with demand. The red is the energy supply, and the blue is the demand, plus changes in storage, plus losses, plus shedding. So what's the cost of keeping the grid stable? Well, uh, worldwide, the capital cost was about $62 trillion. Uh, in the US, it was about $9 trillion, and in China, about $13 trillion. And that translated to the cents per kilowatt hour that you can see there. But what's really relevant is what's the annual cost and how does that compare with fossil fuels? So right now, fossil fuels cost the world about $11 trillion per year. That's expected to rise to about $17.8 trillion per year by 2050. And But the health costs of fossil fuels are about $33.6 trillion in 2050, and the climate costs are about $32 trillion. And so that adds up to a social cost of $83 trillion per year. Meanwhile, if you transition to wind, water, solar, you eliminate health costs associated with energy, you eliminate climate costs associated with energy, and you also reduce your energy cost 63% because you have a 56% reduction in the amount of energy you need. And then there's another 10 or 15% reduction in the cost per unit energy. So that gives you a 63% reduction. So there's a 63% reduction of, of energy cost and a 92% reduction of social cost, which seems to be a no-brainer why we would, why, there's no reason why we wouldn't want to transition. Okay, so the final section I want to talk about is policy. Um, in 2009, I mentioned 
well, we developed our first energy plan to transition the world to wind, water, solar. It was, it was a worldwide plan, but it did not involve individual countries, so it couldn't be effectively um, implemented. And people thought it was pie in the sky. And the, the conclusion of that study was, well, yes, it's technically and economically possible to transition by 2030, but there are social and political barriers. And so a more likely or more practical transition might be 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Uh, little did we know that this turned out to be the scientific basis for the Green New Deal. And although there's no Green New Deal been, that has been passed at the U.S. level, at the, whole, at the federal level, um, it was proposed in Congress, um, and, but it, would never, it was never voted upon. Uh, however, there are 62 countries around the world who've committed to 100% renewable electricity. And only one country, Denmark, is committed to 100% renewable energy across all energy sectors. And most of these are small countries, um, although you know, there's Germany in there too and Denmark. But you know, China represents about 30% of all world emissions. It's equivalent, its emissions are equivalent to those of about 120 countries combined. And then there's the US has a huge amount of emissions, and then there's Europe, the European Union, and India, and other big countries. So we really need all countries acting together to solve this problem. We can't have just you know, a few countries, you know, particularly small countries, that's, of course, that's beneficial to do it in those countries, but that's not enough. We can't become complacent because a few countries have committed to do this. We really need all countries, including the biggest ones. Now, some good news is uh, there are 16 countries and states that are near or above 100% annual electricity generated or consumed from wind, water, solar. And for example, there are Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Albania, Bhutan, Nepal, Ethiopia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, all generate, of, of all their electricity they generate, 100%, about 100% of it is wind, water, solar, with mostly hydro. You can see the H's mean hydro, G means geothermal, W means wind. Uh, Kenya, Tajikistan, and Namibia, well, they're that about, they're above 91% wind, water, solar in their generation. But the only one of the that whole group that is major, its major source is not hydro, is Kenya, with geothermal as the major source. However, if we look at the US, there are, there are actually three states that have a lot of wind, water, solar as a fraction of their electricity consumed. South Dakota actually produces 120% of its electricity with just wind and hydro, with 77% being wind and the rest being hydro. It also produces fossil fuels and but, and so it produces about 200% of what it consumes and it ex exports the rest. But the point is of its consumption, over 100% is wind, water, solar. In Washington state, it's about 98.5%. In Montana, it's about 91%. In Scotland, it uh, consumes and the, produces in the annual average uh, over 90% of its uh, consumed energy. In the US, there are now 19 states and territories that have laws in the electric power sector to go to 100% effectively 100% renewables, uh, or although some of the wording is not is different to allow, you know, non, uh, what they call zero carbon sources, if the new renewables are not there. But uh, these states are, well, there's only one by 2032, which is not a state, Washington, DC, um, but then Rhode Island by 2033, Connecticut, Minnesota, New York, Oregon by 2040, Hawaii, California, New Mexico, Washington state by 2045, and then the rest by 2050. Um, finally, or almost finally, th there are 180 cities in the U.S. and counties that have committed to 100% renewables. A lot of them, uh, the Sierra Club really took um, the lead on this to go to these cities and and get uh, really do grassroots movements to get a lot of these cities to commit to 100% renewables. So that was amazing. Um, but many other nonprofits have uh, helped along with that as well. And there are over 400 companies or around 400 companies now that have committed to 100% renewables across their global operations, including eight of the 10 biggest companies in the world, and they're listed here. So um, let me just summarize, because I know I've taken a lot of time. Uh, we, well, we also calculated worldwide, we'd create 28 million more jobs than lost. These are long-term full-time jobs. In the US, it would be about 3 million. Uh, we'd require only 0.17% of land for footprint and 0.36% for spacing. We'd avoid up to 7 million air pollution deaths per year, slow than reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable throughout the world with 100%. Uh, the absolute energy costs, are, which are annual energy costs, are 63% less than with fossils. 
uh, but the actual absolute energy, health, and climate costs are about 92% less. And finally, if you want more information, um, here's some uh, links, including the, the book that was mentioned earlier, and also our energy plans, which you can um, you can actually look at each country or state, and there's, a, there's an actual separate document for each country and state of how to go to 100% wind, water, solar. In fact, if you go to that infographic map near the bottom, there's actually a map you can click on a state or a country or a city to get a plan. And then there's also this online course that basically summarizes a lot of stuff in the book. Um, anyway, I'm happy to answer questions and thank you all for listening. So I will. Professor, that was a, a tour de force. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just remind people who are um, in the in the webinar, uh, type in your questions into the chat and we'll pass them along. I'm going to kick off with a couple of them, but I just want to remind everyone the book is called No Miracles Needed. Uh, by Dr. Jacobson. It's got a, a foreword by, uh, by Bill McKibben uh, and a nice blurb on the front fr by, from Mark Ruffalo. Mark has been deeply uh, involved in energy uh, equity and, um, and sustainability for many, many years uh, and has partnered with, uh, with Mark on more than one occasion to promote that goal. So many questions that come up, but so many answers. Let me just start again with my, my reference book pitch here, that uh, you, get, you get in a debate over uh, nuclear power, uh, payback period for electric panels, even basic things like definitional matters that uh, have to do with, with energy. Uh, all in this book, you can just go right to the uh, appropriate section and you get a very crisp fact-based analytical take on it. But all a lot of this started, you have to read into the book a little bit, um, from your experience as a tennis player. Uh, your, uh, your emphasis on air pollution to me is really, uh, does my heart good. Uh, you know, I think you could argue that one of the few environmental laws that really is regularly working in this country is the Clean Air Act. I consider it the queen of environmental laws. I was raised by two women, so that's the, the direction I naturally go. And, and the focus on that in your analysis as the start of it, that's how you start the book really, is really key. But this started when you went uh, on a, a, a tennis, to a tennis tournament. That was your first impression with, with the, uh, the choking, polluting power of air that uh, does end tens of thousands of lives prematurely in this country and, and millions around the world every year. Tell us a little bit, how did that stick with you? And uh, as an engineer to be focused on environmental health, I salute you. It's really, it's really impressive to start the argument there. Well, it's interesting because when you live in pollution, you don't notice it. But when you live in somewhere that's cleaner and then you go to a polluted air, you do notice it. And I, I mean, I lived in the, grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and it was polluted here too. But I lived in it, so I didn't notice it. But when I, I first went, I remember going to San Diego first to play in a tournament, and I could not believe it because I was just driving on the freeway. It was just scratchy eyes, couldn't see, smells, you know, and starting to cough and stuff like that. And it was just like, this, this was obnoxious. I just thought it was horrible. And I took another trip to Los Angeles, same thing. Um, so things have gotten better, but as I showed in that photograph, they're really still pretty bad. I mean, they are, that is, I mean, we should have blue skies everywhere. And this, you know, that's the goal. This is why we do not want to burn things. We do not want to go to alternatives that allow combustion to continue. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mentioned very briefly that I'm, there might be one miracle we need, and that, that miracle, generally speaking, is political will. We need to develop that. And I happen to think that your book provides the, the scaffolding on which political will can be built. If people just read the book and understand the analysis in it and take the, you know, the takeaways that make it very clear that this is right in front of us now. This is not something that we should be uh, necessarily thinking is a century away. These technologies are here. You know, the, the, the price drops on so many of the components of the energy system you're describing from solar panels to batteries to, you know, all manner of uh, advances in electric vehicles. Uh, when, when you talk about this to uh, a, a skeptical audience that might raise questions about how we're going to make the transition, what, what are some of the main 
points of opposition that you notice, Mark, uh, coming from people about uh, or, or skepticism uh, about uh, your, your thesis and the arguments you lay out here? Well, initially it was, uh, we can't keep the grid stable with renewables. I mean, in fact, utilities would say, back in 2009, they were saying, oh, we can't have more than 20% renewables on the grid without it crashing. And that, you know, that eventually got blown away with more examples coming, you know, five, 10 years later, there are more examples of higher penetrations beyond 20% throughout the world. And in fact, I think by 2016, 17, they were, the, the bar had been limited to, had been raised to 80%. You know, a lot of scientists and utilities saying, well, we can do 80% now, but we just can't do hundred <laughs> percent. Used to be, you can't do more than 20%. Now it's like, we can't do more than 80%. And like, what was the reason they said we can't do it more than 80%? And it was just, well, we need nuclear. We need carbon capture. We need, it was more because we needed to use something else rather than we couldn't do it. And That's right. Yeah. And then it became, then that suddenly changed to, oh, well, it's just more expensive to do it with 100% renewables. And, you know, there's just a, it's just a continuously changing. Well, I mean, it's good that it's actually changing. And it's actually now, I mean, if it's a debate between whether it's 100% versus 90%, at least that's moved, moved it a long way. But, you know, there is no barrier. I mean, as I said, there's, you know, there are 10 countries that are 100% renewables. I mean, they're granted by hydro, but, you know, South Australia, actually the two most reliable grids in Australia right now are one in Tasmania, which is dominated by hydro, and two, South Australia, which is 70% wind and solar. So right there yeah. is an example of, you know, hugely dominant grid that's wind and solar that's actually more reliable than the other grids as it just came out in an article uh, last week. Yeah. So let, let's pick on a couple of, of common topics uh, in the energy on the energy landscape, because you've written about uh, all, all of these in your book and in, in your flood of research and studies that I think all of us in the public interest community who are working on clean energy, Mark, uh, lean very heavily on on your research and analysis, you and your your team at Stanford. So I, again, thank you for that. And I also want to add my thanks to all of the great groups that Bart mentioned at the top of the call. Uh, you know, without them and groups like them, Tesla wouldn't exist. Uh, the renewable, uh, the you know, the electricity standards, the 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 goals at the at state and city level. This is civil society making this happen. Uh, but but there are some big fights out there, and we just had a, a, a new wrinkle in one of them uh, yesterday with uh, a, a green light from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to extend the license at Diablo Canyon. And without going into all the details, say a little bit about why the arguments that we must have nuclear, it's a key feature of our energy future if we're concerned about climate change, why that's why that doesn't really pencil out? Well, I mean, yeah, so let me separate between new nuclear and existing nuclear. If we start with new nuclear, I mean, there's two plants being, two reactors being built in the US, they're in Georgia and the Vogel plant, the same location. You know, they're on years 17 and 18 of between planning and operation, and they're still not running. And they've cost $34 billion so far for 2.2 gigawatts. So that's $15.2 a watt compared with $1 a watt for wind or solar. And even if you look at the energy cost counting for the capacity factors of the two, it's about a seven to eight times, the nuclear seven to eight times more expensive from that plant than new wind or solar. So why in the wind or solar, you can put up in between one, well, rooftop solar, you can put up in six months between planning and operation, but utility scale like one to three years. So would you wait 17, and I'll, by the way, and that's not the only plan. I mean, in Europe, we have Flamanville, Oki, Lodo, Hinkley, they're all taking between 17 and 21 years between planning and operation. So do you want to wait basically 15 to 20 years longer for a technology that costs seven to eight times more per unit energy? It just makes no sense. It's 2023, we need to solve 80% of the problem in seven years. We can't have a technology that if you start planning today will be available in 2040 at the best. And it's just, it's useless. On top of that, you know, for to build that nuclear plant, they've already laid concrete, enough concrete at Vogel in Georgia for a sidewalk from Miami to Seattle. So they've put in a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and not a single bit of that CO2 has been removed 
due to running that nuclear plant. And it's still not going to be removed for a while because they have to keep delaying when it's ever going to start. Yeah. So there are emissions associated with it that are not in their opportunity cost emissions. While you're waiting for that nuclear, you're running the regular grid, which has coal, oil, gas on it. So there, you have to account for that opportunity cost emissions versus solar wind. You have to account for the fact that you have to continuously mine and refine uranium, which takes energy and there are CO2 emissions associated with that. You have to account for the heat emissions from the nuclear plant, the water vapor emissions from the nuclear plant. When you account for all those, you get nine to 37 times the CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour compared with new wind. So, I mean, even though it's better than gas, I mean, natural gas has a lot more emissions, but it's not as good as wind or solar from either emissions point of view, cost point of view, or a rapid rapidity of getting it in action. And that doesn't even account for the fact there's weapons proliferation associated with, uh, nu with nuclear, there's meltdown risk, one and a half percent of all nuclear reactors are melted down. There's uh, underground uranium mining risk. 10% of uranium miners historically have developed lung cancer died from uh, the radon that's resulted, the cancer that resulted from polonium from radon decay. There's another, then there's a waste issue. You have to store 200,000 years of waste or waste for 200,000 years. So there's all these problems. You don't have these problems. So they're energy security problems with it that you don't have with wind, water, solar. Now, we've been told that small modular reactors will improve this. There's no evidence of that. They don't even plan to be available until 2030. And that would just be some test reactors. And who knows that that's already been delayed two years. The cost have already escalated uh, like three times, now three times the original estimate. So they're still gonna have the cost problem. They're still gonna have the delay problem. Still have to mine their uranium is still a problem. Uh, some say they don't have as much waste, but that's because they're closer to weapons grade uranium, they're refining them to you know, higher, uh, closer to weapons grade uranium. So it's more of a security risk. These small modular reactors will be shipped around the world. You know, so they'll go to more countries that will secretly develop weapons under the guise of civilian nuclear energy programs. So, you know, the small modular reactors is no good. What about existing reactors? Well, if they don't require subsidy, like, uh, you know, New York has three upstate reactors that required seven, $8 billion of subsidy to stay open an extra 12 years. Well, after that, you have to still build the wind and solar. So you have to spend another like $10 billion after that. So it's 17.8 billion. Why not just spend that money, the 10 billion right now on the wind and solar and you don't need the subsidy? It makes no sense. In fact, we did a calculation and it made no sense. It was cheaper to build the wind and solar uh, faster and, and then retire those plants. And that's what they should have done with Diablo Canyon. You know, California has the potential to be 100% renewables very quickly. It's already around close to 50%. And, and I mentioned before, there's this, there's this big transmission line to the coast that Diablo Canyon is hogging. And so it's preventing basically offshore wind from going up there. And so there's already $1.4 billion of subsidy going into Diablo Canyon to keep it open, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, I'm sure. And yeah. it's, you know, there's, we need to just rapidly transition away you know, two renewables without getting distracted. If it didn't cost anything to keep the Elba Canyon open, well, then there's the other problem. There's a law that actually required it to have new, new cooling towers, which would have cost $9 billion to $14 billion to install. And that's why it closed initially. So they suspended this law. So all these, you know, th there was a reason for that law. All coastal plants had to have it because there's a lot of fish kill offs. So they've suspended a law to, and they've given subsidies. So there's two subsidies they've given to this reactor to stay open. Whereas California has the potential to go all the way renewables and this is slowing, keeping that open is completely slowing it down and preventing a rapid transition that, that we need. So anyway, the, I think I've said a lot about that. No, no, it, thank you. I wanted you to go through it and it's it, it's also beautifully laid out in the book on, on all of these points because, you know, time and again, uh, a, a lot of folks run into these arguments in the, you know, in the wild and uh, your book's a great resource for, you know, brushing up on uh, the, the key elements of uh, why uh, the, some of these old approaches, the all of the above. I was so glad to see you bash the all of the above thinking that is still, unfortunately, dominating uh, energy debates here. And that I'm referring to the idea of let's just fund everything. Uh, let's keep nuclear going. Let's build more gas pipelines. Let's have some solar on this side and some wind on that side. Um, it's just it's the absence of thoughtful decision making and political will that right. informs all of the above thinking. Um, and so I, I just I think your book's invaluable in, in penetrating that myth, too. 
Yeah, no, all of the above is a bad policy because I mean, maybe like 20 years ago when there's a lot of uncertainty about these technologies, but we know what's wor what's working right now and we know what's being implemented and can be implemented. We know what we need to do to solve the problem. So why are we wasting th money on things we know are not gonna help, either not gonna help at all or gonna make problems worse. Uh, and part of this is because of this, I think this mindset that we're, some people are only looking at climate and they're ignoring security or air pollution. And when yeah, you do that, I agree. you can come up to different, you can come up with different um, technologies. And then they're just, then they're, you know, the fossil fuel industry is kind of making their own proposals to stay alive. And they have a lot of lobbyists so they can, you know, and they can influence, you know, academics too, to give them research funds. In fact, they do that at my own university, you know, ExxonMobil has given a lot of money to researchers to study carbon capture and natural gas. There's a whole group called a natural gas initiative at my university. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, and the, but other universities are polluted by this as well. Of course. So yeah. yeah. I mean, and so the, the fossil fuel funding of universities to perform research, then those researchers go out and say, oh yeah, we should keep money. We need more funding for this. We need, uh, we should be subsidizing these things. Uh, and so that's why the Inflation Reduction Act is now replete with a bunch of useless subsidies for carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, small modular reactors, bioenergy. I'm surprised it doesn't have geoengineering in there too. It probably, it's probably squeezes in there as well. So yeah. And it's, and it's tens of billions of dollars devoted to those losing uh, propositions from the standpoint of, you know, the, the future I think all of us want, which is clean energy, less, less pollution, less death. What, what, let me, let me uh, bear down on another issue. Uh, I, first of all, just to make a note of, and here, I'd love your thoughts on the difference between the auto industry that seems to be pivoting to electric uh, and, you know, basically, uh, once we get the supply of electricity cleaned up, it'll be, ter it'll be a terrific and fairly swift transition, whereas the, the power sector is clinging, it seems, uh, because of their business model uh, to some of these old uh, capital intensive approaches uh, which is how they make their money, investing in infrastructure to uh, build out the grid. And, uh, you know, they, they, even, they even make money cutting down burned trees when they've, when they've uh, caused a forest fire here in California. How, how do you explain how the utility industry can be moved in some of these issues? We have labor unions who want the big centralized power plants to continue. They want, you know, they, Diablo Canyon, they're all about that. What's your sense of the, the kinds of arguments we should be using, uh, kind of points we should be making in the policy sphere to, to uh, you know, counter that? Well, I think the reason there's a difference is because the auto industry relies on sales of new cars to keep in business. And so they have an incentive to build cars that people want which, and that are efficient and they have no reason not to go to energy efficient or electric vehicles. Whereas... The utilities, a lot of them, if they own a coal plant that's grandfathered in under the Clean Air Act amendments and doesn't need to emission control technologies and is, is costs only two or three cents a kilowatt hour to operate, they have no incentive whatsoever to go out of business. So the first thing is we need policymakers to get strong and and make them pay for their pollution and make them you know upgrade. And so that will force them out of business or you know force them to do something different. So they, it's really an incentive system, I think, with regard to the utilities. So we need, that's why it's helpful to have these 100% laws, these renewable portfolio yes. standards. Um, those renewable portfolio standards, you know, a mandate to go to 100% really requires a phase out at some point. Now, having said that, I will note that many of the states in the US that do not have any 100% laws are actually leading with wind and solar because it's so inexpensive. Like eight, in fact, nine out of the 10 states with the most, the highest fraction of their electricity from wind are all states that do not have policies to go to 100% renewables. They're all basically red states. And why? It's because wind is so cheap and so, same thing with solar. So that's two ways you can motivate a transition is having really low cost energy from wind and solar. And the other is to have strong policies to incentivize the transition or to require a transition. But I think you need both. I mean, you need these policies are really necessary to speed things up. Otherwise they'll just drag for a long time. That's for sure. Well, we're we're coming up on the uh, the hour, I think, Bart. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna come to you. Several people have raised their hands, but I can't I can't call on you. Uh, so if you didn't put your questions in the chat, 
uh, quickly do it if you can. We'll, uh, as Bart said, that'll be available later. But uh, I just wanted to um, turn it over to you, Bart, for any uh, thoughts you might have, and then we, we can go to Mark for closing thoughts. I'm I'm astounded at what you two have put together, and so I'll hold up my copy that I've only read through once that needs a couple of reads. But back to the back to the automobile, we have a couple of questions I'd like to add, Ken, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Uh, we have we have a couple of questions about lithium, um, uh, and one is from Kathy Wani. Can you comment on what your vision of the future of the world's precious resources, lithium and cobalt? How can we supply the grid sustainably when the world's lithium reserves are limited? Well, I, th I mean, it, with known reserves of lithium, there are enough. There's enough lithium for I think it was like uh, it's like ten billion vehicles, and there are about 1.4 billion vehicles in the world. Having said that, you know, lithium can all, batteries can now be recycled and lithium can be recycled. And in fact, there are companies like Sonnen recycles all their 100% of their batteries. Um, there's Redwood Materials is a spinoff of Tesla that um, they recycle 97% of all the materials and batteries and also solar panels as well. And also, you know, 40% of, well, there's one estimate that the salt and sea alone contains enough lithium for 40% of all world lithium needs. And right now in the salt and sea, there are geothermal electricity plants that pull up the brine and get, extract the heat from that. And you can take from that same brine, you can take lithium. In fact, there's a project I think to do that. And so there's no additional mining at all. So, and with regard to cobalt, there are batteries like one of the Tesla, I think it was Tesla Model Y, it doesn't even use cobalt in its batteries. So there are batteries, uh, I mean, it was lithium iron, iron phosphate or something uh, that do not have cobalt at all. So there are other type, other possibilities for batteries. Um, but in terms of overall mining, we're eliminating, we will be needing, we will we'll need materials for a transition, but we do not need the continuous mining of fuels. And when you look at the mass of fuels that are mined continuously, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, 50,000 new oil and gas wells drilled every year in North America alone. But worldwide, there's analysis of how much material is mined every year. And you compare that and you add up to the, that material for fossil fuel consumption. Uh, you add to that all the materials used for all the metals used. And then you compare that to the metals needed for a transition. We're talking like much less than 1% of the current mining would go on uh, annually. So it's really a red herring, the mine, whole mining issue in terms of people bringing up, well, you'll need so much material. I mean, that's not what this question was about, it's just about lithium, which I think I answered, but I do want to answer that question because a lot of people are concerned about, will we just be mining something else and lots of it compared to what we're mining today? No, we're going to be mining at least two orders of magnitude less than uh, what we're mining today. In 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 line with that with the battery event, uh, problem or, or question conundrum, Jeff Severinghaus says fantastic presentation. What do you think of the big barriers to grid scale battery storage? You mentioned iron air batteries. Can you elaborate on those? And to the same vein, we have Gordon Edwards saying, "I am interested in in district solar heating using seasonal storage. For example, huge water filled abandoned grain elevators." Uh, he's from Canada. I want to make sure that we take care of our Canadian partners. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll say talk about the district heating first. Yeah, district heating is great. So there's underground storage in boreholes, water pits, and aquifers. And so water pits is like basically a big swimming pool. You have a lot of water, and you have solar panels in the summer or solar thermal panels to heat up the water. And then you it's insulated, and you store that heat. It's up to like um, I think it's up to 80 degrees Celsius and through the winter. Now, if you have a big grain silo, yeah, you can do that on a smaller scale. I don't know how big that, how much water you can put in that silo, but you can store yeah, any water tank. You can store heat. Um, you can you store it in grain, or you can store it in soil or grain. So they're actually modular materials. Actually, I think now that you can purchase where you can store heat in. That's like so instead of having to like put boreholes underground, which is you know that's a big project, you can actually purchase some material that you can store heat in that will last for a while. But it's nice thing about that underground borehole storage and also the water pit storage, it's dirt cheap, excuse the pun, but it's uh, less than $1 a kilowatt hour of thermal energy storage. And now batteries, 
even though it's not the same, electricity is different from heat. They're 100 to $200 a kilowatt hour. So it's really inexpensive storage. And I think, well, sorry, the, I missed the first, the first question was. Um, was was uh, using, I, I, I deleted it. We have like over a hundred questions. So I guess I yeah, I, I'm just now on the question page. I'm so sorry. Maybe, well, that's, maybe you could talk a little bit about hydrogen. I have a, a number of questions about hydrogen. It's, it's uh, from Jill Rogers and Kurt Anderson, um, green hydrogen versus blue hydrogen and the barriers to getting to using hydrogen. I don't want to, um, what do you think, Ken? Is, well, um, well for it, blue hydrogen, we don't propose using at all because it's just natural gas with carbon capture added. So you, it's just already the natural gas production of hydrogen. You need to mine the hydrogen. Your fracking is 60% of all natural gas in the U.S. is mined from with fracking. And then you have pipes. You know, so you have leaks of methane upstream. And then you'll need more natural gas to run carbon capture equipment. So that means more mining upstream, more leaks upstream. that are not, Nothing's captured there. Then you have capture equipment that's inefficient uh, at the capture plant. And so you don't have to capture all the CO2. Uh, but you have more, a little more air pollution because you need more natural gas. Then you have to build more pipes to send the CO2 somewhere else. It's usually going to enhanced oil recovery, as I mentioned, and you lose 40% of CO2 from that process. So the whole thing is just, a, you know, that's so complicated compared with, you can just have a solar panel producing electricity, run through an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen and you've got it and you don't have to have any pipes for anything. You could you actually, and they sh you should produce the hydrogen on site, like at a steel factory or ammonia factory uh, or at an airport where you might need it for long distance aircraft. So you don't even need to transport the hydrogen in that case very far. And, and in fact, there, and now there are even photo cells that you can produce hydrogen where there's a solar panel that the electrolyzer is actually built into the solar panel. So it's one device that can produce hydrogen. Now compare that with that whole infrastructure of mining natural gas pipes, a uh, storage facility or the natural gas, the SMR steam methane reforming plant, more uh, carbon capture equipment, uh, CO2 pipes, and you have to do something with the CO2. Compare that with just one simple device that produces hydrogen from this one panel that produces electricity and the same device produces the hydrogen. Just, I mean, it just makes no sense to go further down that route. But having said that, 96% of all hydrogen is produced from natural gas today. Yeah. Um, someone asked um, on here, Bart, uh, about uh, the, the slides. Will, will, will people be able to get a, uh, the slide presentation somehow? Yeah, I'll send that to you. Available, Bart? Okay. And of yeah. course, you can, this, this uh, presentation, the whole thing will be re recorded and available on uh, various platforms. So um, including Facebook, I think, and among others. So that, that, that's for people to understand uh lots there are lots of questions again i apologize i had i didn't have the q and a uh, window open um but now i do so do we have time for a few more or are we going to run out of uh runway here bart can we and mark i i'm yeah i'm fine concerned for your question. valuable time okay um several people uh, asked uh, variations on uh, you know what the main barriers are to moving towards uh, green hydrogen um, at, at this stage. What, what's, your, what's your sense of that, Mark? What, uh, are they mainly policy? Um, I, well, there, there are electrolyzers being built around the world now, large ones, in fact. Uh, so it was, I don't, I mean, it's certainly subsidies help. And I think in the Inflation Reduction Act, there are subsidies for green hydrogen. So I think that um, has helped and will help promote it. Um, and then, but you do need a demand for the hydrogen once you produce it and you need to, so you know, you have to know what you're going to do with it because otherwise you're going to invest in a bunch of production and not have any um, thing to do with it. So I think you do need, or it'd be ideal to have simultaneous uh, plans like to go to ammonia where this hydrogen is used instead of fossil fuel ammonia um, to for steel production. So have steel plants that are transitioned and also for some long distance transport, like long distance aircraft and ships, like the, like just the other day, a 40 passenger plane was tested with one of the engines running on hydrogen fuel cell. 
being a hydrogen fuel cell engine, it worked perfectly well. So that's a good sign. I mean, there have been smaller hydrogen fuel cell planes, but that's a 40 seater, which is pretty big. So yeah. transportation ships, there are ferries. I think Norway actually today ordered two ferries that are hydrogen fuel cell ferries for its longest ferries, uh, ferry paths it needs. Um, so having demand simultaneously is going to help. Um, but so I don't know. Otherwise, I'm not sure what there are any major barriers. Certainly having costs come down more, even more will help. Yeah, for sure. Um, someone mentioned, um, uh, raised the question of uh, what role you might see for uh, placing a price on carbon, presumably a price that's high enough on carbon emissions that it would uh, it, it would drive uh, polluters to other technologies. Um, what's your what's your sense on that? I I I just from working in Washington, I know it's been a, a non-starter to try and get a working majority in support of uh, that yeah. kind of policy. But what's your sense, Mark? Well, I think it, people, um, it's easier for people to be for something than against something. So being for 100% renewable energy, for example, that has a lot of popular support. I think over 80% of people support that. And then you can, by being for 100% renewables, you accomplish the same thing as a carbon tax because, in fact, but I think it's even more efficient. Um, you know, carbon tax is one policy, but even if you tax carbon, it doesn't stop people from polluting. It just people might pay the tax and still pollute. So that's why even a 100% renewable standard is better because once you get to 100% renewables, if they're clean renewables, that is, um, then you don't have any more emissions. And that you know that for sure. But you can have all sorts of fudgy, if carbon tax can allows the fossil fuel industry, industry to say, we're going to use carbon capture. We're going to use biofuels. We're going to use direct air capture. That's how we're, we're taking carbon out of the air. So we're see we have an effect. We have effectively canceled our carbon emissions. And so you can use all sorts of gimmicks to get out of a carbon tax too. Whereas going to 100% yeah. renewables prevents that from happening because we actually do transition to 100% renewables without you know continuing these fo the fossil fuels. Yeah. Bart, I've got a good question here. Should I jump in, or do you have? Some oh, please, questions? please, please. Okay. Here's a, from uh, Jerry, and forgive me, Jerry, if I get your uh, last name wrong, Jerry uh, Wainetik, or Wainetik. Um, shouldn't we be focusing on parking lot, commercial, and residential rooftop solar in places like Southern California rather than utility scale solar projects that impact our wildlands and uh, raise biodiversity concerns? Great question. Well, I think we need, we need both. I mean, based on our plans for states and countries, I mean, there's simply not enough rooftops to power everything. So we want to, yeah, we definitely more parking lots would be great. I and mean, France, in fact, is now, there. I think it was 10 gigawatts, they're going to put 10 gigawatts of solar on parking lots in France alone. And yeah, we should be doing that as much as possible on roofs. But we also need utility solar because we just need so much energy for all energy sectors. In fact, when we transition, we're going to go down 56% of our energy demand, but all the remaining demand will be electricity. So we'll be effectively little more than doubling or around doubling our electricity uh, demand compared with today. So we need even more electricity sources than you would if you weren't electrifying all other energy sectors. So both rooftop and utility scale are important. Okay, here's a question from uh, John Addison. Dr. Jacobson, I've read No Miracles Needed and see it as a great resource for journalists. But critics dismiss your work as flawed. What are their key objections and how do you answer them? I know you've responded to this question many times before, well, but since it's in the chat, I thought I'd throw it at you. Yeah, the funny thing is that most of the critics are people in the nuclear industry or the fossil fuel industry, or they're supporters of that, or they're supporters of natural gas. There's just, you know, you get, whenever you like propose something that does not include a certain energy technology, you get criticized. I mean, one of our early, one of the main critics criticisms we had was, from a paper from 2015, where we assumed we would add hydropower uh, turbines to existing hydropower dams to increase the peak discharge rate of hydropower without actually increasing the annual water consumption from the hydropower. And I thought that was a great idea. In fact, it's, it's called uprating a dam. I mean, you basically uprate the dam by allowing greater peak discharge to meet peaks in demand because yeah. hydro is very flexible. 
And so that was criticized by people who supported nuclear power. For example, one of the people who supported it, he's, well, they said, they'd said, well, that's just not feasible to increase the peak discharge rate that much. But they did think it was feasible to convert the world to 100% nuclear power, because that's what they wrote a paper. <laughs> one of these, one of the authors wrote this paper on converting the world to 100% renewable power, or nuclear power, requiring like 15,000 nuclear reactors, and there are only 400 today. And you know, so, so it's like people who had a motivation to criticize, and then they don't even realize that you know, these are like or that particular paper. That was one idea. That's one way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. Okay, may may not be practical, but it was technically fine. I mean, to, to you know, to something that would work. It all depends on the cost. And anyway, since then we've we've had other plans that um, do not include that, and we still find that we can match power demand. So I think that was our biggest criticism, and a lot of people just love going back and saying talking about that criticism without ignoring the fact that we've made like at least ten papers since then. And not a, it's not only our group that found that we can do 100% renewables in many different ways, but there are like 20 different groups worldwide. In fact, there was a paper, a review paper that looked at over 700 papers on 100% renewables that have been published in the peer-reviewed literature, and more and more every year. So there are now you know, on the order of two dozen groups and hundreds to thousands of researchers, and as I mentioned, over 700 papers on 100% renewables. So. I think that you know the criticisms are getting weaker and weaker as we go along. I agree, and and you even uh, have a section in the book reviewing those papers that review <laughs> this issue. So even mm -hmm. there, I think it's a as a great guide for people who want to go deeper. First of all, I love I love that you approach this as an engineer as opposed to necessarily an environmentalist. Obviously, you're motivated by deep environmental commitments, but you're you're basically you're basically asking, how do we solve this problem, as opposed to, you know, what what's the what's the politically correct solution, or what's the solution that'll cause the less disruption to the current order of things? You're just taking a straightforward look at at it as an engineer, and I know, you know, your your team uh, at Stanford is uh, is imbued with that same ethic. I wish we had more engineers like you, Mark. Mm -hmm. oh, that thank you. that That's took very that kind. approach. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I really it. do. Uh, do we have time for any more? Or are we about run out, Bart? You got you. To, uh, give me the answer here. Uh, well, the way you framed the importance of Mark's work at Stanford is just phenomenal. We, I, I'm in the coattails of trying to keep up with each of you. Um, just really quickly, there's you know someone said it's Paul Gunter was discouraged by COP27, dominated by the industry and the lobbyists. Um, you've already touched on what sort of productive way we can we can march forward. Nancy Van talks about you know the false arguments against wind, such as whales and birds dying. I I, I say buy buy five copies of the book so she can share it with her friends. And um, Linda Seeley from Mothers uh, for Peace says I don't feel like we have you know enough time for the transition with sea level rise. And, and so, so we, I, I think that, I guess I'll leave it with you to decide what's our best approach moving forward. Well, I'll just Great. say, I mean, I wanna encourage people to stay positive. The good news is we do have the technical and economic ability to solve this problem or these problems, air pollution, climate change and energy insecurity. It really takes collective willpower by all of us. So I think if we stay positive, we focus, the other thing is to focus on what works. Keep our, an old tennis analogy, keep our eye on the ball and don't get distracted by, you know, these fossil fuel ideas of carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen. I mean, those are just promoted by the fossil fuel industry. Don't get distracted by small modular react, nuclear reactors, by geoengineering, by, you know, just if it doesn't sound like it's good, it's, it's probably not good. And if it's, we need to focus on clean, renewable electricity, electricity, heat and cold and hydrogen storage. Hydrogen should only be used for certain purposes and only should be green hydrogen. Uh, we need electric appliances and machines like electric vehicles, electric heat pumps, electric induction cooktops in your own home, weatherize your home. That's the most efficient, you know, energy efficiency. I didn't really mention that too much. Just reducing energy loss from your home by just sealing cracks in doors and windows. Uh, putting insulation around water pipes, 
uh, putting even insulation in your garage or in your home, if you can do that, or you know, new insulation on your roof or under the floor, uh, and replacing your your gas water heater with an electric heat pump water heater, replacing if your dryer runs out, get a, a heat pump dryer, uh, heat pump air heater and air, and air conditioner, electric induction cooktop, and then also obviously promote or try to educate others around you about uh, what you think is good because uh, word of mouth. I mean, this is really an information problem. I mean, trying to reach lots of people about what's possible. Most people are just not comfortable that there is a solution. So trying to be encouraging other people is helpful as well. Well, I think that's a great, I, my, my, my version of that is, you know, we're, we're in a position now where, um, we're, we're looking forward to the creative side of the environmental future where we can solve these problems. We certainly have to keep opposing the bad stuff. That was the beginning of our movement, saying no to crazy, stupid things uh, that were polluting and damaging land and wildlife and Mother Earth just generally. But now we're, I think we're in an era where this, the creativity to bring about change, positive change that can happen, where, you know, you in, in a sense, you're a little less concerned about regulation if you have a, a solution that, completely changes the nature of the enterprise. So we're, we're going to be able to clean things up by doing the right thing instead of uh, spending all our time and effort stopping the wrong thing. That's very empowering. And I, I think for a, a new generation of environmentalists to come along and pick up that mantle, think about it like smart engineers, uh, you know, mindful and aware of these possibilities as as comes through in your in your book and all of your work mark i think that's the most exciting thing uh that's come along uh in a period where you know some of our environmental laws and regulations and the old ways of doing things they just don't work anymore like they used to i was around when we were passing environmental laws every other year um, and that was a great period, and we got a lot done. And we still need to keep pressure on Washington and policymakers and polluting industries and all the rest. But we're playing offense now. These new technologies, these new ways of thinking, these new solution sets, I just think it's very exciting. It scares the hell out of the powers that be, not because they're going to get regulated out of, the, out of existence, but because we won't need them. <laughs> we don't need your coal-fired power plant. We don't need mm -hmm. your your pipelines and all the rest and your your book uh, charts the course. So um, thank you again so much, Bart uh, and the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. Thank you for sponsoring this session and thanks everyone for joining. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. A lot of them I noticed you answered in your remarks and they're certainly answered in the book. So buy the book and one more time, the name of this book is No Miracles Needed, How Today's Technology Can Save Our Climate and clean our air and there it is all right well thank, thank you, you all, all for joining yeah thanks Bart. thanks ken. have a great really weekend you. thank you so much ken and mark thank you very much okay all right take care thanks folks